Okay, we are streaming. Hopefully. Yep, starting up. Okay. Let's check audio. Okay. There we go. So right now, um, I'll switch to when you get started here in two minutes. Yeah, I'll do a little, I'll do kind of a little intro. So I'll switch it to this. And that's what the thing will be for a bit. Okay, so we'll go. We'll get started. And then, uh, then I can switch between these. So you just. Um, well, just let you know when yeah, actually, let's just do that. Okay. Yeah, that'll be easiest. Okay. That way I can control that. And yeah. Yeah. Get time if I have to. Yep. If you want to try and have kind of a time frame you want to keep in, or just what okay. tips, see where it goes. <coughs> I'd say I mean, I do, you know, hours. Three hours, but yeah. Yeah. It goes hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Either way. All right. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because the YouTube crowd, which is going to be on this camera and this one, will uh, also see this. Uh, they're going to be out for blood if we don't start on time. So, so we start at 7. We're going to start at 7. Uh, we're happy to have Lance here as a special guest. Yeah. Sometimes visit the shop. A special. Um, uh, I'm Curtis Fry. But, uh, probably haven't met a, a lot of you, but we, uh, Cheech and Lance and I, and then Sam's help in the back, we run Fly Shop here, Fly Fish Food, and our online channel and everything. Tonight, uh, we're stoked to have Lance. Give a spiel on Euronymphing, mostly why it doesn't work, why you should switch to just dry fly only. But uh, it's the same as Tenkara. It's yeah, it's close. Yeah. That's what I've been hearing on the interwebs. Yeah, you listen. If it's on the internet, you know it's got to be true. So, um, so this is a pretty open format. Well, Lance is going to go through some slides and kind of talk about just. Uh, more high-level talking points and what his experience has been. And then we're going to open it up to everybody for Q&A. And we'll go as long as we need to go. But, uh, yeah, come, come with questions. And, uh, and then afterwards, if there's anything we talk about, most of the stuff we've got <coughs> over there, and we, we can uh, help you with anything on the materials, the gear, thermal tackle, everything you need. And... Uh, should be good to go. So, with that said, that's Lance Egan right there. <laughs> Everywhere I go. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Curtis. So, thanks all for, for coming here, for starters. And then, uh, I guess, thanks to our online audience. That, should we have any of those? Uh, as Curtis mentioned, uh, it's pretty open. You know, if you have a question or something I say that doesn't make sense, raise your hand. You'll have a question. Uh, pretty low key. Uh, we want to just try and get some information to you, uh, hopefully it helps your fishing, um, hopefully it will improve your fishing and uh, will maybe pique a little bit of interest. If you haven't already tried this technique, maybe uh, it will get you to take that step to do it and uh, if you've already done it, then hopefully you'll have some cool questions. Uh, it's again pretty pretty straightforward as far as uh, you know, coming and going, you're welcome to do whatever you want to do. Uh, the restroom is all the way around the other side of the building, so you can use that. Uh, please feel free. So with that, let's just jump right in. Uh, Euronymphing. Let's hit that first slide. So why nymphish? Uh, hopefully you're not here for dry fly presentation stuff because that's not what we're doing today. That's a lot of fun. But uh, why nymph? Uh, one of my main reasons is because trout do more than 90% of their feeding subsurface. I think that uh, you know, anytime you want to try and just catch as many fish as possible, which that's usually what we want to do not always sometimes we just pick a particular technique for the day or a particular type of fly you want to fish um, but generally speaking I feel like most customers that I talk to in the shop uh, want to learn how to catch more fish we're out there fishing uh, if we wanted to just be in nature we'd go for a hike right uh, we're on the river to try and catch fish so why nymph because nymphing catches more fish uh, 
nymphing, in my opinion, is the most technical way of fly fishing. I, I get in, you know, I won't call them arguments, but disagreements, let's call them sometimes, with people that will say dry fly fishing is the most technical, or occasionally someone will say streamer fishing. I would argue that the nymph fishing is the most technical way to catch fish. It's also arguably a little bit easier. I think it's easier because trout do more of their feeding subsurface. But if you think about the way a dry fly rig works, everything's visual, everything you see. You know if the fish is rising, you know where the fish is, right? It's already given you its location. You know where your fly is in relation to the, to the fish. You see your fly. You see whether your fly is getting a good drift, whether it's in the right <coughs> feeding lane. You see when the fish has taken the fly. And uh, everything's in plain sight. Nymph fishing, uh, nothing's in plain sight. You know, occasionally when you're sight fishing, but most of the time we're fishing blind, right? We're fishing likely water. And all of the handicaps, all of the, that's a bad word, all the obstacles that, that uh, occur for dry fly fishing also occur for nymph fishing with the added complexity of subsurface currents. So if you're used to dry fly fishing, you know about uh, lessening drag, right? You throw a cast and your fly is leaving a little wake on the surface. That doesn't work. Uh, we got to get a drag-free drift. With nymph fishing, we have to overcome that, that surface current, right? The conflicting surface currents, as well as the conflicting uh, currents below the surface. So it makes it quite a bit harder. Um, you also, you don't get to see when the fish has taken your fly. You rely on a strike indicator, or in this case, on a cider or a colored piece of monofilament to know when the fish has taken the fly. So I would argue that nymphing is by far the most technical way to catch fish. There's more rigs, there's uh, just, it's just a more complex process. So nymphing is the best way to improve your catch rates. Uh, another reason is you can catch fish on nymphs all year. You could most of the year around here, you could catch fish on dries too, with the middle provo and the green, especially <coughs> the lower a little bit, we get pretty good midge hatches most of the winter. So there are opportunities to catch fish on dries, but if you were limiting yourself to only dry fly fishing, you're going to catch significantly less fish throughout the year and, and especially during winter time. And then why not just add another technique to your quiver? Questions so far? We're just kind of going high level I know. And some of you I know have tried this, so some of this is going to be really basic for a minute. But we're going to we'll kind of cruise through a bunch of the basics for those that haven't tried this. And then uh, we, I hope to get into some more technical questions. So here's just some of the accepted standards of nymphing, regardless of style, indicator, euro, whatever. Drag-free drift, right? you got to have a drag-free drift. You have to have, get the flies down. So flies need to be near the bottom of the river where the fish are doing most of their feeding. We have to use effective patterns. That goes without saying, right? You have to be able to read water. Uh, by that, I mean find water that holds trout. There's, you know, there's a lot of water in a river, and not all of it holds fish. So we need to be able to figure out which parts of the river we should focus on. We need to overcome the obstacles that uh, the river presents us. So again, drag, you know, conflicting currents, uh, wading position, all those kinds of things. Can you guys think of any others? What other, um, what other standards of nymphing have I, what have I overlooked? Ooh, trees. Trees. <laughs> I like it. Overcome the obstacles, right, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I like it. Getting your flies down is definitely can be an obstacle. Cool. All right. So here's what I think some of the obstacles are nor of normal nymphing, let's say, of uh, indicator style or just using a standard fly line. So your thick fly line creates drag. Whether it's in the air or on the water, a thick, heavy fly line either creates sag when it's extending from your rod tip, or when it's on the water, the surface area of the fly line grabs those conflicting currents. So if I'm fishing a river and the current's coming at me kind of here, and I'm fishing maybe up and across with a cast, Inevitably, I'm usually trying to fish slightly slower water, and there's usually faster current between my position and the fish. And when my line hits, that faster current's going to belly my fly line. It's going to pull the fly line that tethers me to my flies faster than the current I'm trying to fish. Right? So the thick fly line creates drag. Next obstacle is that the thick leader butt, uh, the way most of us rig and then rig, the leader material actually creates drag. This will make a little more sense here in a second, but the water column is such that there's a uh, a, a faster layers of water near the surface and slower layers of water near the bottom. So when you take a regular tapered leader off the shelf and you put a strike indicator on it, uh, just say you buy a normal 4x, 5x tapered leader, and you put a strike indicator on the butt section, you're putting a strike indicator on like at least 25 pound and probably 30 pound, maybe even 35 pound test diameter, 21, 22, 23, 24 thousandths of an inch. Uh, pretty thick stuff. 
and that's going to then rest on the surface, which is moving significantly faster than the river near the bottom. Again, we're getting a little technical, but there will be some slides in a second that will help us understand that. Well, that thick leader butt is going to create drag for us. That's a bad thing, so we need to overcome that obstacle. We have to overcome the conflicting currents that I talked about, both on the surface and through the water column. So vertical uh, currents and surface current. And then we have to, uh, with a regular indicator rig, we have to introduce slack to improve our drift. So to that's, that scenario I set up before where the current is bellying my fly line, we have to introduce slack for what we call mending. So we reposition the line upstream, right? Then the current grabs that slack we've taken that we've added and it takes it out and we have to mend again and add slack. That's necessary to get a drag free drift with an indicator. With a Euro rig it's not. And again, we'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. That same slack makes setting the hook difficult. It takes it, it makes it uh, so we have less strike detection and it makes it so that we have to remove all of that slack before we get tight to a fish. Vanna? I'm going to start calling you Vanna. I like that. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> More obstacles. So again, surface current moves faster than the bottom currents. Uh, the indicator tows the rig at surface speed. Again, the surface, as you'll see, is moving pretty quick. And then the last one, weights are our contact points. So anytime you use split shots, uh, sinkers, whatever you want to call them, uh, weights that you add to the leader, those are our, our contact points. So your indicator... Or if you, even if you're tight laying, if you have weights on there, you're in direct contact with your weights. Uh, there are ways to rig to make that kind of good, better, best. For instance, I would argue the best way to have weights on the line are to have weights on the point, on the end of the leader, and have flies above it on droppers, because then you at least have a relatively tight line where you'd get some pretty good strike detection. But if you think about that setup, you're still really in direct contact with the weights. And the, and the current, especially the way that the river works, if the weights are bouncing along the bottom, and your flies are on tag ends in the slightly faster layer of water, the flies can be really getting pulled downstream and the tag can be out of ways to where we don't have direct contact with that rig. Again, I think that's the best way to rig it rather than putting weights above your flies. Not to say you couldn't catch fish either way. I know I've done it both ways and I know it works, but we're doing good, better, best. I would argue good is just having weight to get down. Better would be weights on the, on the end, like a, a bounce rig we call it locally, right? And I would argue that best in most situations would be no weight at all, just weighted flies. Because then again, we are in direct contact with the weights. That's what we're going to do with the year rig. You didn't give me a chance to say Vanna. No! Oh! Vanna, please. So here's, here's a picture of our, uh, our underwater with just a waiting staff with flagging tape on it. So on the top ribbon, you can see it's slightly slower. Just below the surface is actually the fastest current. Okay? So that ribbon's going quite a bit quicker, stays pretty quick mid column. Down near the bottom, it's slowing down quite a bit, and on the bottom, you can see the ribbon just laying there. That's because as the flow, the river, uh, it, as it comes in contact with the river bottom or the banks, same thing applies to the banks, that's why banks are always slower. There's friction there. The water hits the bank or hits the river bottom, and it creates a slower layer of water down here near the bottom of the river where not only can the trout use less energy, but that's also where all their food starts is on the bottom. So they hang out down here. The problem is that our rig has to extend through the entire water column and be exposed to all of these different uh, speeds of current through the water column. Does that make sense? Let's do the next one. Here's another one. <coughs> Current's doing the same thing, going from left to right as we look at the screen here. The surface still a little bit slower just below. Uh, the surface is a little bit slower. It's interesting because it actually comes in contact with air. Air, believe it or not, creates a tiny bit of friction. So it slows down a tiny bit at the surface, fastest is just below, then slowing down, then because we have a really large rock that's submerged, but it's upstream of the current, again the current's coming from left to right, the flow comes over the top of that and actually inverts, so the bottom flags are actually going back upstream. So this is an extreme example, but I put this in here to help you realize that the larger the substrate is, the bigger the rocks, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with pea gravel or sand, this effect of the, of the slowdown is going to be less. If you're dealing with cobblestone, it will be more like our previous slide where it's significantly slower here. And if you have really big boulders, the current can actually be inverted on the bottom of the river for just a small space. But you know, a fish that's right here would actually probably be facing the opposite direction of, of the main flow, as crazy as that is. Um, so just to kind of paint a picture, hopefully that helps you understand what's going on vertically in the water column. Any questions on, on that? No? Man. 
All right, I guess I did a great job of explaining it then. <laughs> Your own nymphing attributes. So. Uh, again, I'm going fast here because I want to just leave lots of time for questions. But uh, urine nymphing attributes. So what we're going to do with the Euro rig, it's different from a standard rig. We're going to use a long rod, 10 to 11 feet. We're going to use a long leader, 18 to 22 feet. Most of the time I'm using about a 20-foot leader, 20 feet from fly line tip to your point fly. Okay, So that's, it's pretty long. It's longer than any other situation that I've used for fly fishing. Uh, the closest thing for me would be still water throwing a team of three flies on a, on a, a lake rig or sometimes in that 15, 18 foot range as well. But on a river, that's kind of the longest I do. So we're going to do hand tie leaders to dictate the diameters. We do sell uh, pre-made leaders like Rio makes one, Umpla sells some. Uh, the reason that I'm not a big fan of those is they start with a regular tapered leader that then comes down to the, the cider. It will work, but the regular tapered leader has a butt section that's thicker than I want. And the terminal end of it, the cider end of it, colored end of it, is uh, is thinner than I want. So I, to buy a taper leader, they don't make a taper leader that starts as thin as I'd like and ends as, as thick as I'd like, if that makes any sense. They're, they're, uh, they're still getting thick to thin, but a regular you know, 4X taper leader is going to be, again, a butt section of like 21, 22 thousandths diameter. And I want something usually more in the neighborhood of, 0 0.017, 0 0.015, somewhere in there for the butt section, and maybe more like, oh, nine thousandths of an inch to maybe uh, 0 0.014 for the cider end of it. Uh, in pound tests, you know, let's talk like 20 pound on the butt or 15 pound on the butt, and down to 8, 10, 12, you know, pound tests on the cider end of things. So we're going to build our own leaders because so far nobody makes a really good one, in my opinion, that's, that's already available in the packaging. Uh, you can get by with them, but it's not ideal. Uh, flies are going to be tied on droppers, so we're not tying anything in line. So not tying to the eye and then to the bend of the hook. We're going to tie a triple surgeon's knot or a tippet ring in and use a tag end off the main line. So our top fly will be on a dropper tag, and then the point fly will be on the terminal end of the tippet. Uh, we do that because it makes it easier to change flies out. You don't have to cut you know, tippet and things on, on uh, the top fly if you wanted to change that one. And then also... The, the dropper system allows a fish to come in and grab the fly without having a tippet tied to both sides. You know, if you can imagine this is a hook and there's tippet tied here and tippet tied here, if the fish comes from exactly the right angle, they could get it. But if they come from any of the wrong angles to take the fly, they run into tippet in the front and the back. I'm still convinced they'll try and eat it, but they don't often get it in their mouth as well. And then the, the other advantage to droppers, in my opinion, is it lets the fly drift more natural. Again, if you have tippet tied to the front and the back of one fly, that fly is, is limited in its ability to kind of look like a natural would and be at the mercy of the current. It's, it's drifting you know, more like a frozen rope. It's just stiff and un, unnatural. So we use droppers. Again, uh, that's not, you don't have to fish droppers to catch a fish. It's just an advantage of doing so, so we do it in this rig. As I mentioned before, we're going to do weighted flies. No, no weights on the leader. That's mostly for strike detection purposes. Uh, you know, you could use weight and definitely catch fish, no doubt in my mind. It's just you're going to, if you're doing some, if you're adding weights to your rig in the Euro system, you're giving up strike detection. And I think you're missing the point as far as uh, how much water you could, you could change by, or how much water you could fish by just changing a one fly instead of having to take split shot on and off. Taking the shot on and off the leader is much, much harder than changing a fly. It really is, especially if you're using round shot. Uh, you know, round shot versus the shot with the little removable ears on them. The removable shot tend to twist your leader a lot more. The round shot twists a lot less, but the round shot are a murder to get off, right? Anyhow, I don't really carry split shot with me anymore. I just carry a range of weighted flies. I think you'll find it's a huge advantage. We're going to use the cider to detect strikes. So I've used that word a lot already. If you haven't tried this before, you're probably wondering what a cider is. That's like eyesight, uh, S-I-D-H. Uh, DH, right? So the cider is literally just for you to see. Um, it's it's a strike indicator of sorts in that we're going. It's brightly colored. Usually they're two tone, and you're going to hold it above the water to watch for it to hesitate, to stop, to tighten up, to do anything unnatural to the current. Just like you'd have your eye on a strike indicator, except that uh, uh, this isn't going to float on the surface. We're going to be using a long rod to hold it above the water. Okay. So we're going to use ciders to detect stripes. We're going to use a high rod that's long, uh, 10 to 11 foot, 2 to 3 to 4 weight rods. 
And we're going to keep contact with the flies by using that super long leader and lead the flies through the drills. Okay? So things that the Eurolimping doesn't have, it doesn't have a floating strike indicator. Um, I'm, I'm constantly amazed that when I do a little Google search every once in a while, I'll find somebody talking about a Euro rig and they start talking about strike indicators. And when you're, you don't understand a Euro rig, that's not what a Euro rig is. No strike indicators, no split shot, no flies tied in line, no mending. Okay, We're not going to be doing any mending. We're going to minimize slack, thus no mending. We're going to minimize drag because we're going to eliminate the surface drag. And we're also going to lessen. We can't eliminate uh, vertical drag, but we can lessen it. Okay? And we're going to maximize our catch. That's the idea with the Euro rig. Cool? Questions? <coughs> yeah? Um, would you say that the length of drag is personal preference? Or no, I would I would say that's accurate. It is personal preference for sure. Uh, I mean, on a really small stream, you could get away with a nine footer. I feel like after getting used to fishing a long rod, where I find where I used to use like a seven and a half foot three weight on a small stream, I now use a nine footer. Um, it just gives you so much more reach. And I know uh, from my background fishing small streams, I used to fish them all the time with like I say seven seven and a half foot two or three weight and maybe a seven and a half foot leader. And now my thinking is the exact opposite of that. I look at the longest rod I could possibly get away with in a stream. Most of the time I still fish a 10-footer on most small streams unless it's really tiny, and then I might drop to a 9. And then instead of a short leader, go a really long leader. Uh, you'll have a lot less drag. Uh, in small streams especially, there's tons of rocks, right, that are making 20 or 30 different conflicting currents between you and where you're trying to fish. So any fly line landing on the water or leader landing on the water that you can eliminate is going to get you a better drag free drift. Um, but yeah, I mean, for my, just in general, the, the rod I use the most is a 10 foot three weight for most of your own info. Uh, some of my friends that I fish with a lot will do 10 and a halfs. Uh, I have 10 and a halfs. I like them as well. Maybe not quite as much for me personally. I'm really used to 10s. I've tried 11s. Uh, maybe someday somebody will make an 11 footer that's great. So far, I haven't found any that I love. Uh, there are some that are better than others. The 11 footers tend to wear me out. I have guns that are a little, about twice the size of Cheech, but they still wear me out. Uh, Speaking of that, when someone asks you a question, just repeat the question so the YouTubers can hear it. Good, good call, thank you. They don't. <laughs> so, so the long rods, 11 footer is too much rod, I think, at this point. It does give you more reach. It gives on weight and it gives on accuracy. It's just not as user friendly. Another question? Uh, uh, if you're fishing like a creek, like a cotton or something very similar to that, where there's a lot over there, but are you, mm -hmm. if you're using a 10 foot rod, are you most just a bow and arrow casting? Or, I mean, how do you get away with casting on the ball? Right, so the question is on a really small stream, how would you get away with the Euro rig and a long rod? And, and I really, Derek, I don't do much uh, uh, bow and arrow casting. I mean, I do some if you have to, but uh, I don't know how to describe it other than you just have to be really aware of your surroundings. On that particular stream, you could definitely get away with a 9-footer. Uh, I would still probably fish it with a 10, though, maybe even a 9.5, something like that. Uh, the long leader, it's going to take some getting used to. It's like all things. You know, if you start with a dry fly and you get used to that, and then you tie on a dry dropper, you tangle, right? And you're not used to casting it. This is the same. If, you, if you're not used to a long rod and you're not used to a long leader, it's going to give you a little grief for a while. This is. There were some other hands up. I was just going to say, along with this question, I, I fished it one foot and I just got a 10 and a half. I was amazed at how much easier it is to cast the, the, the leader. Very good point, yeah. So Blake was just sharing that, uh, for those of us who are online, I know everybody here heard that, but the uh, the long rod is also, that's a good point, it's a, it's very much uh, a tool to help you cast. The longer lever helps you move the longer leader. Usually a longer rod can be softer too. If you have a 9 foot 3 weight and a 10 foot 3 weight, the 10 footer spreads the action out along the rods, so, so it's a little softer and helps you uh, handle that long leader and also cast you know, lightly weighted flies over the Yes? And I think, like, it's not just the longer rods. It's usually a Euro rod that has a soft it makes it easier to pass True. without a heavier than Great point. So the point made there was that the longer Euro rods are not only long, they're a little softer action. Great point. Mm -hmm. Others, yeah? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we will. Cool. Any other questions before we keep moving? 
Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you want to take a couple later, but I'm curious, like, when you're, uh, are you leading, like, you know, you cast, are you leading the fly down the river, or are you hovering above them, or are you kind of like dragging the fly to create some tension in the line, or, you know, that's one thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better on is creating the right line. Okay, yeah, so the, the question that was asked is, uh, are we leading the flies, pulling them, or are we just keeping up with them? And the answer is we're just keeping up with the flies. You don't want to pull them faster than the current. However, if you're used to a, an indicator background, um, I think you'd be amazed if you threw an indicator rig and a Euro rig side by side on the water, and when you're brand new to Euro rig, you feel like you're pulling too fast, but if you pulled at the, about the same speed as the current and you watched an indicator, the indicator would race by your Euro rig. Um, it's, it's in your head that you're pulling the flies and that's bad, but if you're keeping up with current and not pulling faster than current, then you're actually going to go slower than an indicator rig would. The reason for that is if the flies descend through the water column, they get to that slow layer of water and all we have connecting the flies to the surface is our tippet, which is usually on the thick end of things 4x, more commonly 5x or even 6x. So if you can imagine how little resistance, you know, 5x tippet material has through the water column, uh, as those flies get down that slow layer of water, that pull, that pulls or slows the whole rig going through that vertical water column. So you're gonna great question. It'll it'll come up again here in a minute, another slide. But you're just going to keep up with flies. You don't need to pull them faster than they're going. Good stuff. So again, we're no fly on the water is going to eliminate line drag, right? Uh, only the tippet, as I just mentioned, is contacting the water, so we're going to minimize that drag. We're not having fly line on the water. No leader in most situations is touching the water except the tippet that's below the cider. And, you know, again, we'll show you how to rig that in a second here. So no floating strike indicator to tow it, and uh, no split shot. Again, we're just going to have weighted flies, so that's our point of contact. Again, increasing our strike protection. I know I hit a lot of these points over and over, but uh, I find when I'm guiding that... Uh, I have to keep saying the same principles over and over and over throughout the day. So I find that uh, most people learn better if we keep hitting the important parts repetitively. Seems a little, uh, uh, seems harsh and unnecessary, but I think it's necessary. So what do you need to be successful? You need a long, light rod. Uh, again, 10 foot, 10 and a half foot, 11 foot if you'd like. Three and four is most common. We sell a few twos as well. Uh, you need a long leader. Uh, we use Maxima Chameleon and uh, some amnesia materials that are you know, brighter colors uh, in addition to just cider materials. And Lance, hold those higher. We can't. Well, Sam, sit up straight, Milks. Don't come back. <laughs> Is that better, Sam, or keep going? There. <laughs> All right, uh, and again, we're going to talk a little more about leader construction here in a second. Uh, cider material, as I've mentioned, is just a bright colored material. It comes from lots of different companies. We carry it from Cortland, from Rio, from Umpqua, and then we also, again, carry the Amnesia stuff, which is in lots of different diameters and in two different colors. Uh, the, the point of the cider material is just for you to be able to see it. So pick a brand or a diameter that you'll see best. The thicker it is, the easier it will be to see, but the more weight it will have, so it will let you, it won't let you fish as far away the thicker your leader material and your side is. That makes sense. Uh, you'll need some tippet material. Can you do this with nylon? I get quite that question asked a lot. You certainly can. Uh, I recommend fluorocarbon tippet because it's more dense and it's more abrasion resistant. So I think you'll find it lasts longer and it cuts through the water column, especially the water surface um, quicker. Uh, well, on that note, one. One uh, side note is that fluorocarbon is not all the same thing. So you can, there's a common misconception in fly fishing that fluorocarbon is fluorocarbon. If it's 100% fluorocarbon, brand A that's 100% and brand B that are 100% fluoro, all both have to be great. That's not true. Uh, fluorocarbon, just like nylon, they're both monofilaments and they both have all kinds of different formulations. So you can buy really cheap fluorocarbon and you can buy really high end fluorocarbon. My advice is if you're going to get fluoro, get high end fluoro. Uh, if you're going to get the cheap fluorocarbon, save your pennies and buy nylon because nylon that's high end is significantly stronger and significantly less expensive than inexpensive uh, fluorocarbon that's not nearly as strong. So it, just because you're fishing fluorocarbon doesn't mean that it's good. That makes sense. That's, that's why you can go to you know, Walmart, Cabela's, wherever and buy 200 yards of fluorocarbon that's 
20 or $30, and then you buy a fly fishing tippet that's $15 for 30 or 25 yards. It's a difference in quality of material. It's not the same stuff. The diameter, if you look at diameter to pound test, it's drastically different. If you get six pound, you know, whatever brand, key line or whatever you want to look at, people think, well, six pound is what my, you know, 4X or so says. But six pound key line is more like 2X, not 4X. Um, so you're not you're not doing apples to apples there. Can you use key line? I'm just I'm not I don't have any key line. I'm just using an example. But can you use fluorocarbon like that to catch fish? Of course you could. But you're giving up uh, diameter to pound test. Does that make sense? No. Think so. Fluorocarbon tip that I would do. Tippet rings. Uh, tippet rings are still pretty new in the U.S. Most people I find have seen them now, but uh, you can pass them around if you're interested. But they're uh, just tiny rings. Think of the eye of a hook of like. Uh, Maybe a size 10 or 12, somewhere in there. They're just a solid ring. We use, I use them mostly on my Euro rig to connect to the side or to the tippet because I'm connecting tippet that's very thin to relatively thick um, cider material. And when you have two very different diameters, the knots don't link up very well. There are knots you can do that will work, but they don't link up as well as just having a nice little ring there that's really strong. And every time you want to change tippet out, you're not cutting into your cider material. Uh, so they're pretty handy. You'll need a selection of fly patterns in various weights and sizes. Uh, because you don't have split shot to get your rig down, it's really important to have a variety of, of weighted nets. They don't have to be specific flies. You just need to have them in various weights. So we kind of put this little uh, this little foam piece here together. This little this guy with a whole bunch of different nymphs on it, uh, all weighted. Uh, you can pass that around too so you can kind of have a look at them. You know, just as an example, one of my favorite flies is one of my patterns called a red dart, and I, t I tie them mostly in size 14s, but I'll have size 14 red darts with 2.3, 2.8, 3.3, and sometimes even 3.5 or 3.8 millimeter beads, all on the same hook. So I have the same size fly with just different bead sizes, so I can quickly tell in the box which is heavier and which is lighter. So if I'm fishing and I'm not getting down with a 2.8, I put a 3.3 red dart on, right? And you can do that with most of the flies. Now those are usually tied on a jig hook, and I will say that jig hooks uh, allow you to get a broader range of, of bead sizes because of the way that the, the bead sits down, kind of recessed off the hook. Uh, you can get away with kind of way oversized beads on a jig hook. On standard hooks, you wouldn't be able to get quite that broad of a range. You could still probably carry two, maybe three sizes of beads on just a regular curved nymph hook, for instance. Uh, so you'll need patterns, uh, fly patterns in various ways. What do you put uh, weight on your flies when you're trying just to get <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So the, <clears throat> the question was asked, do I add weight to the flies? And definitely we do. Uh, you know, Most of the time, I'm getting more and more to where I standardize the pattern. So like a, a red dart I was using for, as an example a minute ago, I usually do 015 lead wire on those, and I'll put like six wraps on all of them regardless of the bead size. So I can still tell the difference in heavier versus lighter just based on the bead. Uh, but yeah, adding lead to a fly will make it more dense for sure. Uh, however, in some flies, making the adding lead to it will make the fly bigger diameter. And the fatter the fly is, the more surface area it has, the slower it descends. So sometimes you're actually better off to just have the bead and keep the body as thin as possible. Um, some of my other flies like the Iron Lotus or the Thread Frenchie that are both on our YouTube channel, uh, both of those are designed to be really slim and they get down really quick. Uh, Peritagones would be another example of a fly like that that really sinks fast. So we're going to use a Euro fly line. Euro fly lines are uh, specific to the technique. This is another one of those, do I have to have a Euro fly line? No, you don't. Uh, to catch fish, you don't have to have one at all, but it will help you catch fish. Uh, there are those that like to use just a long leader, and you can definitely do that. I'm hijacking. Uh-oh, he's Sorry. hijacking. Does that say umpla on the top? No. Oh. Can you change the... So the, uh, it's the Euro line it's is good. crazy thin. I'll pass this around as well. It's, as good as it it's thinner than uh, like a, a two-weight fly line on the, on the running line of a weight forward two-weight by probably almost half that size. It's really, really thin. So the idea is that it has less sag in the guides, and it has, when your rod's extended, instead of hanging vertically, it will hang at a, at a shallower angle and allow you to fish further away. Now you can, as I mentioned, you can use just a much longer leader. You can put a you know, 30 or 40 foot leader on there. I don't like doing that because I like handling fly line. The monofilament, when I set the hook, it slips in my fingers. 
when I'm fighting fish, especially when it's cold out, I find that I'm, I'm fighting fish, and especially at the last second when I go to land the fish uh, with a lot of tension, the monofilament slips in my fingers, and the fly line I'm just used to handling. I like stripping it in. I like pinching it against the cork to, uh, to set the hook, and uh, I really prefer the gear line. Again, it's just really, really thin. Uh, what else? Some knots. You need to learn to tie a blood knot to make leaders. Uh, a, a surgeon's knot to connect 15 and 20 pound tests will connect the two, but it's going to be a bolty knot and it's going to hang up in the guides. So you need to learn to tie a really clean blood knot and trim the tags totally flush. So cinch it up all the way and don't leave little tags sticking out of the end of the knot. That will hang up in the guides as well. So you just trim it totally flush. Then you'll need a triple surgeon. So I've mentioned that one before. I'll bet many of you already do a double surgeons if you don't already do triples. Double is the one where you, you parallel two lines, create a loop, take the tag in down the tip it through the loop twice and cinch it up to tie the tip of the leader. Does that make sense? A triple, you do the same thing except you go through the loop three times. And then we use the tag end that extends down towards the end, the terminal end of the leader to attach a fly. So we're going to use the triple surgeons to tie the, the dropper, if you will, on our leader system. Yeah. So on that subject, um, I kind of heard back and forth, but uh, using the tag line from your triple surgeon, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of people recommend using the one that's actually facing up towards the, the rock, uh -huh. rather than the two that are going down for less angle reason. Yes. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, my opinion is that it definitely tangles less, but it's also pulling the knot in the wrong direction, so it's significantly weaker to use the top tag. So the question was asked, on a triple surgeon, do you have a tag in that extends up and a tag in that extends down? Uh, some people argue you can use either one. The top tag that is extending towards the rod, let's say, rather than towards the terminal end of the leader, will stand out away from the main line and tend to tangle less, but it's pulling the knot directly apart versus the downstream tag or the terminal end of the tag pulls the knot tighter and pulls the knot together rather than pulling it apart. So the strength difference to me outweighs anything as far as tangles. Uh, I mean, for me, when I use the top tag, it's it can't be anywhere near half as strong. Uh, I wouldn't do it, but I know people that do, for sure. Uh, again, I have giant guns, so I break fish off all the time. But, uh, no. yeah, I, I just was curious. Like, like, I've tried it both ways. And good and bad results both ways. Yeah, good question. Good question. Other questions? Yeah? The dropper loop, I haven't messed with much, so I would imagine it would work. Uh, I couldn't tell you from experience on it. It seems like it would be a little more challenging maybe to tie with two different uh, sizes of materials or, um, I don't know, Does the, the dropper loop, you're creating a loop in it, pulling it through, and then trimming. It's a, it's a connected loop, and you trim one side of it. Is that the one I'm not thinking of right not? Hmm. Uh, so the question was asked of what a dropper loop work. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know the answer. I haven't played with that one. I've tried with several. I've tried several other knots, but that one I haven't messed with. It probably would work great as long as it's durable. I've tried a blood knot. I don't like the blood very much. Uh, using the tag for that end, I like a blood for leader connections, but for that dropper, there's something about having you know the material come down and having the one piece stand perpendicular, and it's almost like uh, wire when you're tying a fly and you you wiggle wire back and forth. It breaks right there at that point. Where the triple surgeons, where it's naturally hanging in line, it just doesn't break as much for me. The dropper loop may still have that same problem as the blood because it's it's standing perpendicular to the main line. Does that make sense? Again, I haven't tried it, so I don't know on that particular one. It's a good question. It'd be fun to one to play with. I think I know the knot you're talking about, and uh, it, it, would it, add, it would make it so that you have to add another knot to tie your more more knot bulk there. Yeah. Mm. Maybe so. Mm. Yeah, I guess to me, if you were going to do that, I would probably <coughs> replace it with a tippet ring because it's, it's modular then because you can have your leader coming down and then tie a tag in and off and a terminal end to the, to the point fly as well. Lots of ways to do that for sure. And there's another hand. Sammy? Yes, yeah, so I was fishing on Saturday and two things. Um, I was fishing, there was a current 
um, flowing right to left, and I was fishing across the current, like I wanted to get into slow water on the other side and play the current barrier. And I was, one, having a problem coming in contact with the fly that far away, but I, when I switched to heavier flies, they're too, they're too heavy. If they got down too quick, they're hanging up in the rocks. Um, how do I come in contact with my flies in that situation? Hmm. So the question was asked uh, is that uh, he's having a hard time getting down in a particular run, so he added heavier flies and he was getting down too much. Uh, is that fair, Sam? Yeah, I'm so, just really being in contact with him. I'm so, fairly far away. Okay, fishing a fair distance away. Hard to say without seeing it, Sammy, but I would think that you could probably have used the, if you're getting down too much of the second flies, you probably could have used the first flies and just changed your entry angle to maybe add a tuck cast. And a little bit of slack to let the flies get down, you know, quicker right out of the gates before you got in contact. Um, otherwise, the the simple answer would be to have flies that are right between those two legs, right? <laughs> um, the, other, the other question, sorry, you're out of time. Sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, so it was really windy that day, and the and the wind was blowing my meter all around. Um, is there any way to combat the wind other than a thinner meter? Just go home. Yeah. Go home. Yeah, so the question was, it was a windy day as well. Uh, is there a way to combat the wind on it with a Euro rig? And there is to a point. Uh, the wind, I would say, is certainly one of those things that, as fly fishermen, that's our nemesis, right? We, The wind is not good at any technique. With Euro nymphing in particular, it's probably worse than other techniques because with an indicator, at least you're anchored to the surface. Uh, with a Euro rig, you're trying to hold everything above the surface. You can still your own nymph in pretty strong wind, but you have to usually use heavier flies. You'll have to fish closer to you and keep the rod much lower. And I tend to take up a lot of slack. Instead of casting and keeping a high rod in the wind, we cast a lot, take up slack by stripping in a couple times as the flies are descending and then just trying to get in contact when they're at the deepest part of the drift. You know, with a low rod, uh, with much less line out, you know, the more line and leader you have out, the more surface area the wind has to blow. So you lessen that amount of line and you try and keep contact. It can be really challenging though. The worst is an upstream wind. Um, downstream, at least it's putting tension on your leader. Upstream, <coughs> your flies are going one way and the, the wind's blowing your leader the opposite. So wind is definitely a, a problem, but it has to be pretty extreme wind before it's a real problem. Uh, and as you mentioned, Sammy, thinner leader definitely helps. Again, lessen <coughs> that surface area for the wind to blow. Yeah. So I don't want to jump ahead of your presentation, but what have you found to be uh, on your tippet connection to your fly? You have you know, a couple of different flies on your tippet. What is your kind of tag length, your optimal length to keep tangles at a minimum but still a lot of natural drift? Good question. So the question was, what's the optimal length on a dropper pad? Fair. Uh, I think it's about six inches to start. If you're if you're longer than that, for me, it wraps and tangles more. If you're shorter than that, then you can only retie two or three times. Uh, you know, again, that varies depending on diameter material, stiffness of material. Stiffer materials tend to wrap less, uh, but generally speaking, I'd say about six inches. Uh, good stuff. So, selection of fly pattern, Euro line. Oh, one thing I didn't t cover on the Euro line is you don't really have a loop to loop connection. So, you're going to have your fly line to leader connection go in and out of the guides constantly on a Euro rig. All the time, every single cast, it's gonna get, you're going to strip it in the guide at the, at the beginning or middle of a drip, and then on the next cast, you're going to cast that line leader connection back out. So loops are murder because they hang up in the guides. Uh, personally, on all of my rigs, all my trout fishing outfits, the first thing I do when I get a brand new fly line is cut the blasted loop off. I hate those things. They hang up in the guides. They're really convenient, right? They make it easy to just take a loop leader and, and connect it to your fly line. But that loop-to-loop -loop connection is bulky and cumbersome, and it hangs up in the guides. And in a regular rig, it's not that big of a deal because you're usually fishing enough fly line out the rod that you can every you know every two hours it comes into your rod rings when you go to reel up and you know change rods or something. But with the Euro rig, where it's going in and out of your guides every single cast, you got to get rid of loops. The best connections, line the leader, I think, are a needle nail knot or a super glue splice. They're both really smooth. A really clean nail knot will also work. Uh, some fly lines there at Cortland makes a line that's also a mono core. The one we carry is a braid core because that's our favorite. It has a little less memory. But they do make a mono core. And the mono core, you can strip the coating off of it and tie a blood knot to your butt section and trim the tags. And that goes through the guides pretty well too. 
But I just use the braid core line, and I usually do a needle nail knot to my to make them really smooth. So going now the guides. Uh, again, learn to tie a blood knot. Uh, leave your indicators in shot at home. That's not permanently. That's just to learn this technique. I I don't want to be the type of person that's telling you you're never going to use indicators in shot again. That's not true. If you already know how to indicate in them, you shouldn't you shouldn't throw that stuff away and discount it. You're going to have times and places where you're going to find that's the most effective technique. However, to learn this technique. From my own experience, I would I found that when I was first introduced to a style of your nymphing, uh, I always carried my indicator and switch on my pack, and I'd fish for 20 or 30 or 40 minutes with a Euro rig when I'm brand new at it. I have no idea what I'm doing, and instead of really giving it a fair chance for a couple hours and actually learn something, I'd get impatient and go, well, I know I can catch fish with my indicator rig, so I'd put the Euro rig away and get my indicators and shot out and, and get catching fish. Uh, now you, you, you hear that and you go, well, why wouldn't I do that? It's working. And, and it will work. If you've all fished your uh, indicator rigs and you caught fish, you already know it works. I think you'll find that the Euro rig allows you to fish way more water types uh, and water that you used to walk right by, you'll now, ca now catch fish in. So I would encourage you to just leave the indicator and shot home when you're trying to learn the Euro rig. Eventually, I think you're going to get to where you'll, you'll, you'll know when to use each one. Each one has a time and place where it's the best rig. Uh, just my advice is leave them home when you're trying to learn your nymphing because you're going to otherwise, unless you're much more disciplined than me, which you probably all are, uh, you're going to fall back on that handicap, right? Okay. Uh, spend some time working on the cast and learning the technique. Again, just don't give up on it too fast. Uh, when I'm guiding, the most common problem we have is, is casting. Uh, beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day, casting, casting, casting. That's what holds most anglers back from catching two or three times as many fish as they could when they're Euro nymphing specifically. The muscle memory that you've built to make a really beautiful regular fly cast is different than a Euro rig. The Euro rig, we like to take flies out under the rod tip going back and on a tight line, swing them all the way around and then take them over the rod tip going forward. So that's different in that your regular fly cast, you take flies over the top of the rod, both back and forth. So there's a different muscle memory you're going to have to build there. The other difference I find is I tease all my clients, I tell them all now at the beginning of the day. First thing I do is I teach them how to, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hit the rod, we're going to throw it downstream, we're going to go like this, we're going to cast, and so on. And I say the roll cast every single time. The roll cast doesn't work at 9 o'clock, it doesn't work at 11, it doesn't work at 2, and it doesn't work at 4 or 5. The roll cast does not work. Your muscle memory, though, at the end of a cast, end of a drift, is going to be indicator rig, water load a little bit, and roll cast it back upstream, right? This is not going to work. We don't have fly line that has mass and stick grabbing the surface of the water. So the roll cast just does not work at all with your rig. Try and fight that muscle memory. Uh, get the flies out of the water, give them time to unroll behind you, and then take them over the top of your rod. I think you'll be much more accurate that way. Uh, again, working on the cast. I can't tell you that one enough. That is, that is number one problem with this technique. It's, it's a long rod, it's a soft rod, it's a crazy long leader with weighted flies. It can be a nightmare. <laughs> uh, I tell most of my clients, some people, uh, I charge a little more to guide than most places around, so people will say, man, I don't know if I want to, you know, I don't want to pay the whole full day, can I just do a half day? I'll say, yeah, we can do a half day, but I, I tell them right up front, after four hours, at the half day, I'm, I'm gone, that's what you paid for. And it usually takes people two and a half, three hours to just barely get the, the basics of the cast. The latter part of the day is where everything comes together. And I'm telling you that because mm -hmm. I think people get frustrated with the casting of this really early. It's just not easy. It's not user friendly. Some of the best casters in the world that I know still struggle when they're trying to learn this technique. That's the <coughs> hardest part of it for sure. Uh, <coughs> Uh, a shameless post or a shameless plug for myself. Uh, get modern nymphing and modern nymphing elevated videos. Okay. If you don't have these, yes, I'm in them, so I'm incredibly biased, right? Uh, let's just get that out in front. But I think you'll find that uh, they're actually very well done. Uh, Gilbert Rowley and Devin Olson, I teamed up to do them. And Gilbert is a magician. Uh, literally, if he can make me look good, he can make anybody look good. So we catch lots of fish in the videos. They're entertaining in, in addition to being instructional. Uh, if you don't have either of them, start with Modern Nymphing. That's the first one. And then if you uh, get through that one, then get Elevated. Modern Nymphing Elevated is, is building on what you already learned in the first video. So they're available in a DVD form. We carry them in-store and online, store.fivefishfood.com. 
Uh, you can also get the digital downloads through Vimeo. Um, you got to get those. I think they'll make a lot more sense. It's visual that way. We talk you through the techniques and you're seeing it at the same time. Great help. Some other recommendations, get Devin Olson's book, Taxable Fly Fishing. That just came out like a week ago. Um, and George Daniels' book, Dynamic Nymphing. Those are two of, in my opinion, the, two of the best books on the subject. Uh, they'll, they'll cover a lot of the stuff we're talking about and in greater detail. All right, sir. So here's the leader building, the best leader to start with. I say to start with in that this is a relatively thick leader. So we start with uh, 20 pound test, Maxima Chameleon. These have the really cool pro bands too. If you ever have any of your tippet that comes off the spools with the stock uh, elastics that come on them, these things make it really easy. Uh, we've got those online in this store as well. So Maxima, we're going to start with 20 pounds. Uh, we get asked this a lot too. Maxima Chameleon is brown in color, and people wonder why is why do you have to use that? You don't have to. It has nothing to do with color. It has everything to do with this. See how that has a lot of memory? You give it a quick pull, a little bit of stretch, and it lays perfectly straight. That's why we use Maxima Chameleon. It doesn't have to be any other material other than we just don't want it to, uh, you don't want to deal with a slinky all day, right? You want your leader to be smooth and straight. So every time you pull it off the reel, it's going to take a set to the round reel. So you warm it up, run it through <coughs> your fingers, give it a little stretch, and it'll lay perfectly straight. Okay, Maxima Chameleon. Uh, for the first couple sections, and really you can even do the third section, Maxima Chameleon. Lately we've been playing with Amnesia a lot more because it's really high vis. So we've been doing that, that bottom section uh, with Amnesia. And then attach just your cider material, cider of your choice. Just pick a cider, that, again, that you see best. Some, I find most of my clients see this yellow color better. A few people see the bicolor with kind of the orangey-red color better. If you see one better than the others, go with it. There's no right or wrong there. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture of that. This will, of course, be on YouTube later, so if you wanted to uh, reference it down the road, it will be there too. Uh, this same leader formula is in this video, except that it has uh, all chameleon instead of the amnesia part of it. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it's going to build you a pretty long meter. That's necessary. Okay? Oh, this one looks right for us. This is a snippet from kind of the trailer for modern nymphing. Uh, maybe. Oh, wow. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. That's right. That's well, you know, let's see if it'll go. I clicked the wrong button. First says you clicked the wrong button. What a noob. <laughs> I was introduced to European techniques a little over a decade ago. What we have now is a culmination of all of the best parts of all the techniques. another shameless plug but uh, I think he hopefully you'll find that it's again we really strived in the video to not only give you instruction but to make it kind of fun to watch we felt like a lot of instructional videos had good information but they also make you fall asleep and we wanted to try and make uh, some to put the two together make it uh, a little more fun uh, what else do we have on there I think we had just the next slide had again uh, where to buy news to Europe oh, it's gonna start over what we have <laughs> I think on this one, yeah, it's going to loop for an hour. I think I had to just um, hit escape and get out of it. And then, yeah, Cheech, do you know anything about computers? So, again, you can get uh, the videos on our website. Uh, you can get the digital download on Vimeo. 
Uh, lots of other area shops have them too. For those of you that are on online, maybe your uh, local fly shop carries them. If not, uh, please ask them to. Uh, otherwise, you can see the trailers on YouTube and Vimeo. What else do we have before we just open it up to questions? What's the next That's one? That's about it for Emily? questions. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay. Common Euro questions. So we've covered some of these. Do you need a 10-foot rod? I think we've kind of talked about. Will a five-weight rod work? Yes, uh, but it's it's heavier and stiffer than you'd like. I think you'll find you break more fish off with it, and uh, it's going to fatigue you more. It's going to be harder to cast the rig because it's not as soft as it should be. Uh, to try it, your nine-foot five-weight would work. Just know that it's limiting. It's, uh, it's not giving you the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, what if I fish a large trout? Will a fin weight be okay? I get that question a lot. I you know every everybody's convinced they fish for giant fish everywhere they go. Say, oh well, I get guys a shot all the time. Oh, I, I catch big fish, so I don't need a three weight. I need a six weight that's a ten footer. And you're like, well, yeah, I get you where, where you're coming from, but unless you're catching like 10, 15 pound fish all the time, a five pound fish on a three weight is not a problem to land. You're not limited by the rod. You're limited by the tippet. So with a Euro rig. 4x is thick, right? We're not fishing streamers, we're fishing small nymphs. So to, to enable your flies to get down and get a good drift, 4x, 5x, 6x is what you're going to be using most of the time. And with 3x, or sorry, with 4x, 5x, and 6x tippet, with a three weight rod, you can apply maximum pressure and still break a fish off with 4 or 5x. So with that in mind, if you can break 4x with a three weight, what advantage does a 5 or a 6 or a 7 give you? It doesn't, right? you're already able to apply maximum pressure. What you have to get used to is the rod getting, getting a deeper bend. It's, gonna, it's a softer rod. So the rod's going to bend more than you're used to, but the rod's not holding you back on big fish. In fact, I would argue a long light rod would be a, a preferred tool usually to land a large fish. It has a lot more give, especially on fine tippet. Now, if you're fishing articulated streamers, that's a different ballgame. That's not your only thing. Then a six or a seven, not for fish fighting necessarily, but for casting the flies is a big advantage. For this, uh, you'll be fine with a three-weight. Uh, again, is a Euro-specific line necessary? We covered that. Not really, but a uh, big help. Uh, how do I build a leader? You know, you need a little bit of the materials. You need to learn a blood knot. If you don't already know it, other than that, you're good to go. Uh, which knots should I know? Again, the blood, the triple surgeons, and some sort of uh, line to leader connection. A good nail knot will work great. Uh, Am I supposed to pull the flies faster than the current? We asked that question earlier. No, you're supposed to pull the flies the same speed as the current, matching the current, so you're just keeping contact with them, not moving the flies faster than the current. Question? Back to your knot question. Huh? So the question is, what knot do we use to attach the flies? So good question. <coughs> I most of the time use an unimproved clinch knot. Uh, I change that when I get like 6x and smaller. I usually go to a uni knot personally. Uh, if I want an ultimate strength, the trilene or a palomar really is the strongest knot, but it uses a lot of material. Uh, usually, though, for 5x and thicker, a regular clinch knot works great for me. Uh, one funny thing about knots, clinches, and an improved clinch knot, I find a lot of my clients are used to tying an improved clinch knot, and they watch me do it, and I don't improve it, and they ask me, why don't you improve it? And the reason is because it's not as strong. The improved clinch knot takes an extra step and in most materials, it's actually weaker. So if you want to save yourself a step in a knot, don't improve a clinch. Maybe put one extra wrap around the main line and just poke it through the end and you're good to go. Uh, good question. Uh, do I have to tie flies and droppers? Again, we covered a lot of these. Do I? No, you don't, but it's a huge advantage. Do I have to fish Euro nymphs for the technique, or will my regular nymphs work? You don't have to fish any specific flies other than they need to be heavy. So if you have confidence flies, uh, you, you know, flies you already catch fish on on your indicator rig, the fish are going to eat those just fine on a, on, a, on a Euro rig. You just need to figure out how to make them weighty. So if you're using a brass bead or a glass bead, adapt it to a tungsten bead. Uh, if they're, you know, a little sow bug or something, put a little silver bead on it. Maybe wrap a little lead wire under the dubbing instead of just the dubbing. Uh, you just need to make them heavy. It doesn't have to be, they don't have to be on a jig hook. They don't have to have hot spots. I think you'll find as you get into Euro nymphing, you'll probably gravitate towards some of those tendencies that you see in the Euro flies, but uh, they don't have to do that. A hair's ear and a prince nymph catch lots of fish. But just talking with you about these experiments, some of them feel like you won't catch as many big fish, and then you'll have to do the way the fly is as you would have a really small size fish here, and it's not. 
Okay. Yeah, I would say total baloney, but uh, I mean, the, so the, the comment was uh, some people feel like they catch larger fish on unweighted flies. Fair? Like a, a non euro nymphing reel. Even like a, you know, you know, like I have a pat door or kind of, they're just fishing little teeny kind of flies. They are, yeah. So I'm glad you brought Pat Dorsey up because Pat is a friend of the shop. Uh, he is an incredible angler. He's a great guy, right? And he does fish that way. He fishes indicators and tiny flies. Uh, if you ask Pat about euro-nymphing, he goes, I'm old school, man. I don't do it. But he, he openly admits he's the only guy in his shop that doesn't do that. So uh, we get a lot of the guys in, on our fly tank with Uncle Cheech, a lot of the Coloradans that think they have to fish 22s and 24s to catch fish. Uh, if they went to their local fly shop You're over there, uh oh, lot, sorry, <laughs> we're not trying to pick on anybody, but if if you talk to the guys in Colorado, they're Euro nymphing. I have a whole bunch of Team USA teammates that are from Colorado, and they're not fishing 24s. They are fishing light tippet, but they'll fish 16s and 18s, sometimes a 20, and they catch lots of fish <coughs> and lots of big fish. The technique is, uh, in my opinion, the technique again is more effective for a broader range of water types. It's not the end all be all. There's still times and places where an indicator is a better rig. There just is. But I, uh, I would tell you from my own experience, I've fished an indicator less than probably five times in the last decade. Uh, that's not because I'm, I don't, I won't do it. Not that I turn my nose up to it. It's because most of the time I don't think it's the better rig. That's my opinion. You're going to get lots of opinions. But you definitely, I, you'd have a, you'd, you'd never convince me that that euro nymphing is only better for smaller fish. In fact, I would take a challenge to your buddies. <laughs> let's uh, let's make it interesting. Let's go to the middle provo this summer, and we'll we'll tally their large fish on a day versus my large fish. They can use any size flies they want. I, I, I would love to do it. I'm serious. I'm serious. I would love to do it. Mic drop. We get so I, I see their point. I mean, there's there are again, we're we're generalizing here, right? But there are water types, there are pools that are slow and deep, where you can't effectively fish a euro rig. So, I guess to to really answer that question honestly, I would tell you that the guys that are saying that are used to. I bet I I could probably pattern what they fish. They fish slow, big, deep runs on maybe our local tailwaters, where a euro rig is not the best rig for that particular piece of water. But what they're missing is they're going to fish one piece of water for three hours, and they're going to catch who knows how many fish, 5, 10, 15 fish. And if they fish the, you know, 100 yards below and 100 yards above, in the same amount of time, they could probably catch twice as many fish and catch just as large a fish in different water types. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. It's just the difference of which technique is, is better in each water type. Is that fair? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. My uh, my experience, especially with brown trout, brown trout, big browns like to be up on banks and up in shallow water. In fact, late here in the audience, I had the pleasure of, of guiding. Uh, was that last summer? Last spring. Yeah, last spring. And Blake caught one of the larger fish I saw with my clients come out of the river. And in a spot that, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Blake, but I think Blake mentioned after we caught the fish there that he said that he wouldn't have even fished there before because it was skinny water and it was a big brown and uh, the fish ate the fly the second the fly hit the water. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't but maybe 10 or 12 inches deep and it held a giant fish. It was a water that an indicator rig could be fished there, but I would make you a bet that like 99 out of 100 indicator guys would walk right by this piece of water. Uh, again, that's not to say that there aren't big fish in big pools, but that's fair. A lot of the biggest fish I see come out of weird water types, especially on our local fisheries. More questions? All right. So for the guys who are starting out, mm -hmm. what, what type of water is going to be the easiest for somebody to, to start at? You know, is it going to be a nice long run? Is it going to be hot water? Good question. So the question was, what's the uh, what's going to be the best water type to start on if you're going to urine nymph? And the answer really is dependent on time of year, but uh, generally speaking, pocket water. It's it's more forgiving. It lets you get closer to the fish. 
Uh, the fish have to make a, a split second decision. That's going to be the best place to start. That said, uh, if you're fishing right now and the water's 38, 39 degrees in our local tailwaters, they're not really in pocket water. So then you got to fish <coughs> the drops in the pools and the slower glides and places like that. But great question. Yep, over here first of you. So on the green, I haven't tried to get it. I've done a lot of pro football success, but I'm wondering on such a big river, how effective it is to use your own. Good question. So the question is on a big river, specifically the Green River, how effective is your nymphing? And uh, the question is, it's still pretty effective. Uh, personally, it's not my favorite thing to do on the Green River. I like to go there and, and float fish out of a drift boat. I like going drives. I like going dry droppers, streamers if I have to. But I have your it. It's very effective. Uh, you have to pick certain water types. The Euro rig is is not very good on that particular river from a drift boat because you know most of the fish are pretty taller in the boats because they see them going by, but they don't feed right near the boat. They let the boat, you know, they feed in front of the boat, and as the boat passes, they start feeding again. So an indicator rig, in that particular instance, you're able to cast it 30, 40 feet ahead of the boat and get a good drift ahead of the boat before the fish have a chance to know you're there. Uh, so if you're fishing from a drift boat, it can be done, uh, but I think a Euro, or sorry, an indicator rig is usually better in that particular instance. If you're wade fishing the green and you're fishing sections like down by Little Hole or the riffles that are right up near the dam, the first you know bend or two, um, your own nymphing can work really well in that water type. You may consider <coughs> lengthening your tippet from your cider to your flies because it's bigger water and it's deeper water. You may need uh, more distances than what we're generally giving you for more medium-sized rivers, let's say. Uh, but it, it definitely works there. Some of my Green River guide friends spend a lot of time your nymphing the the green when they're not doing float trips and just just waiting themselves. Good stuff. Yep. Good questions. Yeah. So the questions asked were: Does it matter whether you put your heavy fly on the dropper or on the point, and does it matter the distance between the two flies? And I think it matters in both cases. Uh, that said, I don't think there's a right and a wrong as far as fly placement goes, heavy on point or on top. Uh, I usually tend to have my heavy fly on the dropper. Uh, most people I see tend to put their heavy fly on the point. I put it on the dropper because I feel like I can keep my heavy fly from hanging up by keeping more tension and, and leading the with the cider, that heavier fly, and having a weighted fly but not as heavy behind it and get both of them down in the same water foam. I feel like I fish both flies lower versus if you put your heavy fly on point, the only way to keep it from hanging up in, in shallower water is to lift the rig and then your top fly is out of that water column where you ideally where you want to be. So I feel like having the heavy fly on top for me allows me to fish more water types. That said, there are some places and times where I put two heavy flies on really fast uh, or deep water. I'll just fish two really heavy flies so they both really punch down to the bottom. Uh, and you can, you know, when the fish are really active, I sometimes use, let's say in a hatch situation where there's mayflies hatching, I'll put a point fly that's heavier and then unweighted like a soft tackle on the dropper. And you can throw a rig ahead of some rising fish that you're, you, you see leaving the rising rig where you visually see the fish hanging there. You throw the rig upstream and let the point fly get down. And just about the time your soft tackle gets to the fish, you just start slowly lifting your cider. And you've got tension on the point fly so it, it raises up and that that lifting of a soft tackle or just an emerger type pattern right in front of a feeding fish can really be deadly at times. So there's there's a time and place, I think, to have heavy flies in both positions. Uh, as far as the distance between the flies, uh, the, I, I'm, I, stand, I do the standard uh, competition legal distance, which is 20 uh, inches or 50 centimeters. Uh, that, I feel like, is obviously if you're not fishing competitions, you don't have to worry about that. Having done that, I've fished them shorter a lot because I start them long, and as I change flies, they get short. And the shorter they get, the less fish I catch. I'm much more confident with it 20 to maybe even 25, 26, 24 inches between flies. And then I think you'd find in uh, productive waters like our local Provo River, uh, with lots of you know thousands of fish per mile, I catch two fish at a time a lot more when my flies are spaced out. When they're really close together, it almost never happens. If you put them 20, 24 inches apart, you'd be amazed how often you catch two at a time. Yep. Are you using, other than like hot water or really deep water, are you using 
Yeah, so the question isn't other than pocket water and really deep water, am I usually using two flies? The answer is yes. I use one fly occasionally in really shallow water or really tiny pockets where <coughs> having two flies spaced apart uh, is really difficult to get them both to land in a really narrow seam without, if you land one fly in slow and one fly in fast water, the, the faster one tows the slower one out. So occasionally we'll fish a single fly, but uh, I pretty much always fish two outside of a few uh, instances. I really, I've played with three flies, I really don't fish three flies much anymore. You could, on a really big river it might make some sense, on most of our streams and rivers around here, it's not necessary, I don't think. Good stuff, yeah? One of the areas I really struggle with is when you're trying to fish them up in the bank and you've got a deeper channel that comes in and that bank, they're kind of starting to get extended. Getting those flies down and getting them through for any bits that can start on that. So if I understand your question right, it's just it's the trouble is getting uh, down in a really deep run that's a really long trip. Well, it's fishing you out in the bank when you've got a deeper channel between trying to oh. fish that softer water on the other side. Okay. And getting a good drift through there when you're more extended, you know, you've got more line out. Okay, yeah. So the question is more uh, you can't wade close enough to get a really good drift on a, on a deep trench or fast water or something. So I think the, there's no real easy answer there, but there's a couple of tricks. One would be uh, to get your flies down faster and make a really vertical presentation, uh, which is covered in the videos. But you, you can, if you land your flies more horizontal, you use the surface area of the tippet. Uh, between the flies and below the cider to really um, buoy the flies up in the water column. They sink slower this way than they do dropping vertically with no tension on them. Does that make any sense? Sure. So if you wanted to get down fast, instead of landing the flies horizontally, you would land the flies really vertically and give them slack to get them down deep. Uh, and that would get them down faster. And then uh, to be able to fish further away, a longer rod and a lighter leader, the thinnest leader you can stand will allow you to fish further away. The problem with a thinner leader is the thinner you go, the harder it is to cast. So like my guide trips, when it's a first time where I start them with, you know, much like the leader we had on the board that's pretty thick for Euro standards, but it's it's easier to go from a regular tapered leader and fly line to that leader than it is to just go like straight, you know, 3X or 2X leader, which would be a more extreme thin leader. When you say a thinner leader, are you saying not being like the 2015, 12, but like a 15? Yeah, all the above. Or the most uh, current thing in competition circles is going fly line to like straight 3x or 4x all the way to the side. Uh, not tippet material, we're using different materials there, but uh, that diameter. Um, it's it's murder to cast. And I mean, I say that like it's the hardest thing I've ever cast in my life. <laughs> it's hard to be accurate, hard to keep control, but allows you to fish much farther away and with much lighter flies. Imagine, you know, every every diameter you step up in line and leader, if you have your rod extending here and you have a thick fly line, the thick fly line hangs vertically. If you get a thinner fly line, it hangs a little more at a shallow angle. If you get a thinner leader, it hangs at even a shallower angle. Eventually you get to where it's so thin that you can fish further away because you're not having that vertical sag, right? So the thinner the leader is, the further you can fish uh, from your position, but again, handling it, casting it, Retrieving it, all that is is really difficult. Um, you know, I, I would start maybe I would start with the uh, thicker leader if you get comfortable with it. Instead of doing 20, 15, 12, drop it down to like 15, 12, 10. If you get comfortable with it, go like 10, 8, 6, something like that. Or you can even just run. Eventually, you can just run a straight one. It doesn't have to taper. Taper helps with turnover. It helps with accuracy. For the, the again the, the thinnest of leaders. We're just using straight leader all the way to the side, straight material. Uh, they're just, again, they're the hardest to cast. Questions? No? Um, I think we're, I other guess, than... I guess I have one. So yeah? you talked about having your flies enter a more vertical angle. You do that by using a tuck cast. So you, uh, on the forward stroke, you give the cast more energy than it needs to turn over. So in the air, the rig actually inverts on itself and falls flies first. Um, you have to do it with a little extra, you have to do it with more line than you need to just cast straight, if that makes sense. So you'll need a little more extra leader. And you finish with the rod high, you can even give it extra power to the forward stroke and pull back slightly to help it invert in the air. Um, that's really the, the gist of it. You're just trying to make the flies hit first and the the cider kind of fall on top of them so they can just free fall instead of having water tension holding the whole leader up as it slowly settles. 
There's a question from the YouTubers. Cool. You're on nothing out of a boat. Yeah. Perfect. So a question from YouTube is, uh, you're on nothing out of a boat. It can be done. It's not as easy. I think it's better wade fishing. But uh, you, as we mentioned before, in some sorry, in some rivers you can do that, uh, where the water clarity is such that you can be pretty close to the fish, or uh, the fish even if the water's clear and the fish are just tolerant of boats and anglers, not a big deal. I know Devin Olson and I had a really good day on the Henry's Fork last year. You're on that thing, uh, just almost straight out the sides of the boat. Um, you know, just pulling on the oars a little bit, slowing the drift down, throw a cast out, and just the oarsman kind of matches the speed of the drift as where we're trying to fish, right? So you're pulling on the oars a little and just keeping contact, and you're able to fish banks and edges and drop-offs and in front of rocks and behind rocks and all that kind of stuff. It can be done. It's more challenging, and it's something that admittedly I have much less experience doing than wade fishing, but uh, certainly can be done. Any other good YouTube questions, Cheech? Um, let's see, you're talking about how do you decide um, how long your hook is going to be underneath your cider? Good stuff. Very okay. good, like, starting point. And then the, the next question is how do you choose the flies you're going to fish for? Okay, so two YouTube questions. One is, uh, well, let's, I like the, the last one best, so let's, let's start with that one. Uh, how do you choose which flies to fish? And in fact, if we go one more slide, I think we even have a, uh, ah, look at that. How do I know which flies to use? Uh, use your confidence patterns, you know, fly side slim. Again, that's for, for gaining depth quickly. Uh, I say jig hooks are king. This isn't helping with, with patterns, but we'll get that in a second. Have a variety of hatch matching and attractor patterns. Here's the key right here. A presentation trumps fly pattern. This is true in all fly fishing. Uh, you can have the right fly and be presenting it the wrong way and catch nothing all day long. Um, you'd be amazed. That I've worked in shops for 20-something years now, and I'm always amazed, especially when we have hatches going on, how many anglers come in and say, you know, uh, I've tried the blue wings are hatching. I've tried a blue wing at olive. I've tried a parachute at Adams. I've tried a no hackle. I've tried a visidun. I've tried this. I've tried that. And none of them work. And so which of your booing patterns actually catch fish? And you're like, whoa. You know, you have to be careful because you don't want to make them sound like an idiot, but they really all work. Uh, there are times where they might favor one or the other, but they're all going to catch a fish. Uh, more of it has to do with how you present that fly. So nine times out of ten, if they're not catching fish on any of those patterns, it's because they don't understand what a drag-free drift is. And that's uh, easy to say here. I can tell you from guiding hundreds and hundreds of people that – most people think they're getting a good drift, and they're still getting micro drag. They're getting the tiniest amount of drag. Their fly is not leaving a wake right behind it. It's not getting really influenced, but it's getting just enough drag that it doesn't look natural, and then it doesn't matter what pattern it throws, the fish aren't going to eat it. So presentation trumps fly pattern. That's also true in nymph fishing. Uh, if you look at most of the flies we pass through, half of them don't imitate anything. Most of my patterns don't imitate anything. I get people asking all the time. Why does a fish eat a red dart? Why does a fish eat a rainbow warrior? What does the Frenchie imitate? You know, what does the Tungsten Surveyor imitate? I have no idea. I don't really care. As long as the fish eat them, I'm not worried about it. Uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, you got to have your confidence flies. Uh, you know, again, have, fish some of those that you like. In our videos, we have some of mine and Devin's uh, favorite confidence flies. Maybe they'll become your confidence flies. Do we have one more? in there too that still has the picture that, yeah there we go so this is a picture I like and I have in lots of my presentations uh, I like it because it's a stomach sample I pumped out of a trout that I caught and it proves that they're not only eating one thing right this is really common I pump fish not every day but I, I pump a fish maybe or two every other time out just because I'm curious always to see what they're eating but the funny thing about pumping a fish is you kind of know something they'll eat because you already caught a fish. If you can pump a fish, you have to have caught a fish, right? But it's interesting to see what they have in them. This fish has a green drake nymph. That's a midge pupa. There's an adult blooming olive, a midge pupa, mayfly nymph, a midge shuck, two blooming olives. There's a black ant in there, a black fly larva, and on and on and on. You can't, you can't tell me this fish is selectively feeding on one insect. I joke in a lot of my presentations that we as fly fishers tend to think that the trout are down there on diets. Like there's a brown trout on the probe right now that's going, today I'm on a midge diet, right? 
I'm only eating midges. Midge, midge, I'm going to eat that. Oh, look at that stone fly. I'm not eating those today. I'm on a midge diet. Sure. They don't do that. <laughs> they do not do that. They are opportunistic feeders. Look at this. He's making this all up. I'm making it all up. <laughs> there are obviously some flies that they key in, right? They, they feed on, on the Provo, they key on midges and uh, sow bugs and certain times of year, betas nymphs a lot. They eat a lot of black fly larvae on the Provo. There are some flies that they constantly have in them, but again, they're not only eating one pattern. I catch fish on the Provo, on the middle Provo in particular, on stonefly nymphs all year. Stoneflies are in the river all year. Everybody has in their head that they only hatch a certain time of year, which is true. But remember, they didn't just like drop out of the sky at full size. They grew over the course of a year or two or three years to that size. So they're always in the river, and because of behavioral drift, they're always being, uh, you know, not every stonefly in the river, but some of the stoneflies every single day let go of the rock that they're on for evolutionary reasons and drift downstream, sometimes 10 feet and sometimes 10 miles. And while they're doing that, they're vulnerable to the trout. So everything that's in the river could become part of the trout's food at any given time. So again, I just want to stress, it's not the fly, right? It's just your presentation. Um, we like to blame the fly, but... And flies can make a difference. They can, they can. But don't, I feel like most anglers waste too much time worrying about the right fly. When in reality, if they went to the river with the wrong fly and just fished it right, they'd catch a whole bunch of fish. Uh, the fish are opportunistic. Uh, let's see, Cheech, I went off on tangents and forgot the original question that I didn't like. What was it? You talked about the flies. Tippet length. Tippet length, thank you. The other question on YouTube was tippet length. So how do you decide how much tippet to run with? Uh, the, uh, the, the answer there is not very easy, but keep in mind that you need enough tippet to get down and the rig doesn't sink vertically, right? It sinks at an angle. So it takes more distance to get down at an angle than it does vertically. So if you're fishing four feet of water, you probably need at least six feet of tippet between your, your uh, cider and the flies. And early in the drift, they're not, your flies are not going to be on the bottom. They're going to be descending. But through the middle of the drift and the deepest part of the presentation, those flies will be right down near the bottom. Um, you'll have to play with that. I tend to use about six feet from my, from my tippet ring to my first fly. is kind of my starting point in most places. And then two feet to my second fly. So I usually end up with about eight feet total below my cider to my point fly. I find that I fish longer than most of my friends. Most of my teammates on Team USA fish more like four feet to their first fly and a couple feet to their second again. Uh, so they're fishing shorter. I think the biggest difference there is where you put that weighted fly. You need the most distance between your heaviest fly and the cider. So if you're putting your heaviest fly on point, then you probably can get away with a little more compact tippet. If you're putting your heavy fly on top and your lighter fly on point, then you need longer distance between <coughs> the cider and that, that top fly. That makes sense? Uh, but you need a little bit longer tippet uh, than the depth of the water just to allow the angle to get down. Good YouTube question. Yeah. So other than, um, you know, if you're going to a new body of water that you've not fished before, mm -hmm. and short of turning rocks over, do you have any tips on prospecting with nymphs in a new unfamiliar territory? Good question. So the question is, uh, in, in a new river you've never fished before, maybe how would you get fly selection, right? Uh, for me, the answer is simple in that I don't, I really fish like 10, 12 flies kind of everywhere I go. Uh, I change their sizes, I change their weight, sometimes I tinker bead colors a little bit, but uh, I don't know, I find like a Frenchie works here, it works in Wyoming, it works in Idaho, it works in Slovakia, it works in Slovenia, it works in New Zealand. Uh, trout are trout are trout, they're, again they're opportunistic. So you can fine tune colors and things in, in that way. I don't find that I fish a lot of different flies. That said, uh, you can tell a little bit about what a river is going to be like as far as size of flies and maybe types of insects that would be most prevalent based on the type of river that it is. Uh, a tailwater or a spring creek type fishery would tend to have more small, more small invertebrates. Uh, there's something, I don't, I'm not a biologist so I don't know how this works exactly, but there's something about consistent cold flows that a tailwater, which is below a dam, where a spring creek provides that makes the most you know, diminutive insects really prolific versus a freestone river that has no dams on it, that comes either from rain, melt, uh, rain or snow melt uh, right out of the hills, no dam to cool the water. It has more extreme fluctuations in flow and in, in water temperature. But for some reason, those tend to grow bigger insects. 
So you'll usually find giant stone flies on a really uh, highly oxygenated uh, uh, free stone river. Less stone flies on a tailwater. That's not to say there won't be any stone flies on a tailwater, but less, right? You'll find big net builder caddis on free stones. Again, you can find them on tailwaters, less prolific. Uh, on a tailwater, you're going to find tons of little midge larvae, tons of black fly larvae, tons of betas, maybe lots of trichos. Uh, versus, you know, again, the, the free stones, you don't see as much of that stuff. They're there, but they're not as prolific. So you can learn a little bit about uh, just knowing where you're going to go. You can, you know, any, any more, you can go on Google and say, you know, I'm going to the Madison, I'm going to Henry's Fork, I'm going to Penn's Creek, I'm going to wherever. Uh, and you can learn a little bit about that way. That'd be one thing to do. But then just acknowledging what type of river it is can help you gauge some insects. So if I were going to a freestone, I would probably start with like a patch rubber leg stone and maybe a Frenchie or a red dart and a Frenchie, something that's kind of big and bulky and opportunistic feeders would grab hold of, and maybe something that's small like a Frenchie or uh, a zebra mid would work fine, any sort of small pattern just to give them two different options. If I was going to a spring creek or a tailwater, I would probably find out if there's studs or sow bugs there, and if so, I would probably start with a stud or sow bug pattern. And maybe try a little beta or image pattern. Is that there? Uh, good question. Other questions? Cheech, more YouTube stuff? You covered most of it. Um, there are some people talking about how to pitch the San Juan or winter flies where they only eat 20 and 20 quarters, especially never streamers. Especially never streamers. <laughs> so, so some people on YouTube are asking about uh, tailwater, specifically maybe the San Juan, where you have to fish micro flies uh, and never streamers. I think he's joking about the never streamers because we've been murdering lately up there. with a Euro rig and a, a really heavily weighted streamer on a, on a jig hook, you know, a 60 degree jig hook with a slot of tungsten bead, and throwing casts in winter water in slow pools and letting the flies get down and just manipulating, animating the flies through the drift. So you're, you're dead drifting them for part of the presentation and lifting and dropping the flies vertically. So when the water is really cold, uh, trout are much less aggressive to chase. So you know, stripping a streamer on a sinking line or a sink tip can be productive, but it's usually less productive when the water's in the 30s. But the trout that will be collected in big pools uh, in winter water, they'll be in there by the hundreds on our local tailwaters. And you can sometimes be in small pieces of water that have literally hundreds of fish in a place the size of this, this room, and you throw a fly in that, a streamer that kind of goes up and down in their face instead of swinging by them horizontally really quickly, you get a much longer, slower presentation, and, and they'll eat streamers really well that way. As far as the tiny flies go, a uh, place like the San Juan, I would fish a worm imitation that's big and heavy along with something that's really small. So I'd use uh, something that's you know bigger and heavier to help you get down, and then something really small to go along with it. That said, there's a, there's some places on the San Juan I know that are big deep holes, but there's also big flats on the San Juan that just have little depressions. And those little depressions, you can easily get down with like a 16 and 18, or a 16 and a 22, or an 18 and a 22, with a little tungsten bead on there and fine tip it. When you only need to get down a foot or two, it doesn't take much weight to get down. So you can still use some small flies. That said, I think that there's something magical, uh, that's a stupid term I know, but I think there's something to, uh, honestly I believe you get a better drag free drift with a Euro rig in most situations where uh, I think fish will eat bigger flies that you wouldn't catch fish on an indicator rig. Um, I don't really have any real you know, data to support that other than just experience. I just know when I used to indicator fish a lot. I had to use smaller flies, or maybe at least I thought I had to use smaller flies, and now that I Euro fish, I hardly ever fish smaller than 18 to 20, and even those are rare. I fish a lot of 16 and larger, even on tailwaters where, you know, like our local tailwater, almost all the guides use 6X, 7X, and 20s to 24s all winter long, and I guide it with like size 10s and 16s and 5X. Uh, we both catch fish, not one that's right and one that's wrong, it's just that you don't have to necessarily fish the tiny stuff, I don't believe. Good questions. What what else, Chief? Any any others online? You talked about reducing tangles, I think. Um, yeah, reducing tangles could be done with casting mostly. <coughs> um, most tangles are caused from improper casting. We have a lot of questions also as to why why not just use pivot rings uh, for your dropper section. Mm -hmm. You talked about practicing not telling and how that will 
Cool. So one of the comments online was why not just use tippet rings for the droppers, and you certainly could. Uh, the reason I don't do that is that they tangle more for me than just a triple surgeon's knot. That's the easy answer. If you use them and they don't tangle for you, then I would say keep running with it. It's great. Uh, as far as Cheech was bringing up the point of just practicing your knots, uh, when I'm guiding, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag a little, which gets uncomfortable. But a lot of my clients at the end of the day, they note how quickly I tie flies on. I'll say, let's change flies. And I'm, this, isn't, uh, this isn't unique to me. Almost all guides do this because they tie flies on all day long, right? That's their job. So you get really good and really efficient at, at quickly changing flies. And I have clients all the time that say, you know, we change flies all day. I would never do that because it takes me 30 minutes to change a fly. And you're going, 30 minutes to change a fly? Man, you gotta, you got to do something to fix that. Get some readers, practice. you got to do something. But that's a long time. If you're not able to change a fly in a minute or a minute and a half, which seems like an eternity, um, you should be able to change a fly in 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, it doesn't take very long to thread a fly and do a really easy knot. So to Cheech's point, practice your knots. Uh, I've, I've been fishing with my father a couple of times. who is not an angler. He likes to go uh, because he likes to hang out with me, which is crazy, but we won't go into that. But he, uh, he's not an angler at all. So every time we go, I drive, and I make him, I give him like some, you know, Maxima or something that's inexpensive, and I'll just say, all right, Dad, here's a fly. You've got to practice tying your knots the whole way there because I'm not going to do it all day long. You have to practice. Same would go for everybody at home. Uh, fly fishing is funny this way. I'm amazed at how many anglers kind of identify as a fly fisher, yet they don't practice it at all. Uh, by a show of hands in the audience, how many of you can honestly say you've ever taken a fly rod to a park and cast other than landing? <laughs> wow, a lot of you. Usually when I ask that question, uh, how many of you are lying? How many of you are lying? <laughs> Usually when I ask that question, I get like two or three hands out of 20, 30, 40 people. Uh, my point is, like if you're a golfer, you hit buckets of balls all the time, right? That's, that's what you do. You have to get good. People figure that when they go fishing, that they just go to the river, they're practicing casting the whole time that they're, they're fishing. And you are to a degree, but you're not, you're not focusing on the mechanics of the cast. You're worried about that fish that keeps rising that's driving you crazy, right? So you're just not, you're not fine-tuning your cast. My point is, again, the same with knots. If you're not, you're not practicing knots, you don't have to practice them the rest of your life, but you've got to practice a knot enough to get you know, good at it, good enough at it that you can change flies or quickly change tippet and so on. Uh, so just, just practice, you know. When you're watching a football game or a baseball game or, heaven forbid, you watch golf, uh, you know, and you're really bored and you don't want to take a nap during the, the golf tournament. I'm teasing for those of you that golf. Right now. But grab a little piece of tippet and, and tie some knots. It's really easy to do. Good stuff. What other questions do we have? Okay. Uh, maybe. So the question was asked if you're fishing really, uh, you know, heavy substrate, let's say, where you're getting snagged a lot. Uh, what could you do to compensate for that? It, number one, I think if you're getting snagged a lot, you probably have flies that are too heavy. So first thing I do is lighten your flies. Uh, second thing I would do is if you're throwing in and, and contacting bottom early in the drift, so uh, let's say you change flies and you're still doing it, then you should keep your cider higher off the water to not allow the flies to get as deep. Uh, you have a lot more manipulation with a, with a Euro rig than you do an indicator. An indicator, you can move the indicator up and down, but you have to stop fishing. You need to take the indicator off or depending on the indicator type, slide it down the leader. With a Euro rig, you don't have to bring it in at all. You just cast it out and either, you know, if you want to get maximum depth, you keep your cider right near the surface of the water. If you want to keep the flies shallower, you keep the cider higher off the water and you fish it at a shallower angle. So you change the angle that you're fishing the flies, lead the cider lower so you're using that surface area of the tippet to plane the flies up and go lighter. Um, I think you'll find you can you can change that a lot without even changing flies. Uh, yeah. But you talked earlier about fishing catching fish, a big fish in about ten inches of water. Yeah. How are you fishing ten inches of water? Ten inches of water, the Euro rig with two really light flies, like a couple couple 16, 16 and 18, you know, two point three millimeter beads. And you're not doing long drifts, you know, you're talking about pockets that are five, six feet long. So you cast it in, and the flies, I feel like in, you know, 10 inches of water, the flies are vulnerable to eat to catch a fish the second they hit the water. Where in four feet of water, unless the fish are eating, you know, suspended eating emergers and dries, they're really not fishing until they're down near the bottom, right? In shallow water, 
you have to cast with the cider off the water, which you should do all the time anyway, but it's most important to have it in shallow water where you're tight to the rig the second the flies hit the water. Blake, how long did it take for your fish to eat that fly? Not long. Yeah. It hit it hard. It hit it hard and it hit it like the second it hit the water. So if he didn't have the perfect cast set up where the flies hit the water and the cider was tight and, and ready to register a strike right from the beginning of the cast, he wouldn't have caught that fish. I think we were fishing a 14 with probably a 2-3 bead to maybe a 2-8 bead and a little 16 behind it. Red dart. Red dart is exactly what it was. And, uh, you know, again, you're only fishing, you're not going to fish 12 inches of water for 30 or 40 feet. You're going to fish 12 inches of water five feet at a time. So you're fishing kind of in this. In our second video in Elevated, we talk about that fishing the hammock or fishing the elongated U. As your flies hit the water, they're descending, then you get to the deepest part of the presentation, and then you get them out and you're done again. And every time you take steps upstream, the deep part of your presentation changes angles. So even if you've thrown, or changes places where you're fishing, in, so even if you've thrown a cast in an area and you feel like you've covered it, your flies probably covered it, but they didn't go down to the fish's layer, right, to where they're down near the bottom. So if the fish is here and your flies landed there, they weren't down until they're behind the fish. But as you move upstream, now the next cast your flies uh, enter so you're here. That water up Correct. And it Correct. Making lots of short, quick drifts. So you're throwing in, leading the flies, and and breaking it into smaller segments, and not and you're not trying to fish a long, long drift in 12 inches of water. By doing that, most of the time you're probably fishing, fishing more of a fixed length of line at that point, right? You're not shooting too much line. You out. wouldn't shoot a lot of line, yeah. That's a. If you're fishing shallow, you don't need a lot of extra line. Yeah, that's true. So the question asked what is, are you fishing a uh, fixed length of line and that's in a shallow water situation? And yeah, that's true. You you can still fish a fair ways away. You can't throw so much line out that uh, in that situation that you're going to have to lay leader on the water and take up slack because you'll be out of contact at the beginning of the drift. But in, I could fish from me to you with your rig easy uh, with two light flies and a light leader without uh, any trouble. I'd throw a cast with that rod high and just take up slack as it comes to me. Um, you, you could still shoot a little bit of line. You know, you're not limited to fishing first or second row. You can fish 20, 30 feet away for sure. You can't fish 50 feet away, but mm -hmm. yep, good stuff. Go I'm going back to this question about the snags. It took me a long time, correct me if I'm wrong, but it took me a long time to switch over to the jig hooks. Mm -hmm. Just because they're more expensive. I was like, I already have a mini size, or a fly size. Mm -hmm. The others, I have a ton of the hook. But just the way it sits in the water, it's inverted. Yeah. It, it goes over rocks and moss. It puts the hook part at the top. Correct. So you just kind of get some more pressure down here. Yeah. 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 And yeah it, the flies like aren't back, so that hook part is not contacting the rock. Mm -hmm. Great point. So for YouTubers that didn't see that one, the point was made that uh, the jig hooks are really. I had a slide up there a minute ago, but I. I cruise past that one. It said jig hooks are king, right? A uh, few of you may, maybe saw that one, but one of the bullet points has said that. Jig hooks are king for two reasons. One, again, I've covered already. You can put a broader range of bead sizes, and the second one is that they invert, so they ride hook up, and it's a great point. They don't hook the bottom as much. Uh, jig hooks are available from almost all the manufacturers now, so uh, you can get them in various price points. My absolute favorites right now are the, and have been for more than a decade, are the Hannock 400s. Uh, there are lots of them out there. I think you'll find that jig hooks will hook fish in the roof of the mouth, so you land more fish, they grab a little more meat, and they allow you to fish a broader range of beat sizes. Yes. If you're, you're looping routes in the habitat and you can start riding the fish, do you still have a drag fly on each Yeah, so the question asked was if you're urine nymphing and a hatch comes off, can you? Uh, put a dry fly on the Euro rig, and the answer is yes if you're using the right leader. So if you're using the leader like we shared, it has a little thicker butt section that you can cast, and you definitely, I, I do it all the time where uh, I just cut off my top, the nymph, I'll leave the tag end on there, but just take the nymph off and tie a dry fly on the terminal end of the tippet. It's hard to cast because it's an 18 or 20 foot leader, but uh, with a little practice, it can be done, and you won't find a softer set down than a, a Euro line with a 20 foot leader. You're not going to send any fish running for their lives from the impact of your fly line hitting the water. That said, it is really challenging to cast. It can be done. Uh, the other thing you can do, a lot of people just carry a spare spool for their reel uh, with a regular fly line on it. And if the hatch comes off, it takes a minute and a half to 
pull one spool off and get the other one out of the bag and snap it in and run it through the guides, put a paper leader on there and your fishing dries. Yep. I have a question on that subject. So mm -hmm. I uh, last Saturday I was up on the below over here mm -hmm. and uh, I came up on a pool and I, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't want to change my plot. Sure. Um, but the entire <laughs> pool was riding. There are fish all over the place. And I had a really successful you know, half hour in that pool, and I never changed, took my nymphs off. And I think I, I kind of tried to tell myself that presentation is on the fly. Mm -hmm. Even though they were rising, there were, I still caught a lot of fish and I decent sized fish in that pool. Yeah. Um, and out of sheer laziness, I just didn't put on the drive. Gotcha. I, mean, I love catching fish on drive as much as the next guy. Sure. And then I don't feel like refining. Right, right. And then what, what I have on is working. So <coughs> I, I feel like I try to remind myself, but just because the rising doesn't mean it's going to be too low. Yeah, I think you'd find, uh, to your point, most of the time, if, if you see 50 fish rising, there's probably 300 that are still not rising that are subsurface feeding. Uh, especially on a place like the Provo with you know, three or 4,000 trout per mile. You're, you're going to have a lot of fish that are never even showing themselves. Uh, so definitely, I mean, I'm with you. I love fishing dry flies. I know because I'm a competitor and because I, I'm known for Euro nymphing, a lot of people assume that's all I do. Uh, most of the summer, my own fun fishing, I just like to throw drives. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do. Uh, but there are times where that's not the most productive thing to do. So nymphing is, is great. And like you said, if you're fishing along and the big hatch comes off and you just don't want to take the time to fish drives, that's up to you. You get to choose. You can definitely still catch off the fish subsurface. Uh, I was guiding on Monday. And uh, we had a pretty good midge hatch on the Provo, and we got in a pool kind of midday where there were quite a few risers. And the guy I had had hired me to learn your nymphing, so I asked him if he wanted to fish drives, and he said, "No, not really. I can do that anytime. I want to focus on your nymphing." And so we fished the pool for a minute. We missed a couple in there, and then there were enough fish rising that was becoming bothersome to me. <laughs> not that he didn't seem to care, but I said, "Hey, why don't we uh, just move downstream and we'll..." fish some moving water. And he said, okay, let's do that. So we jumped out and we went downstream and instead of casting around a whole bunch of risers where there was another guy that uh, decided that the pool we were in was also his, so we decided to leave it for him. Uh, so we went downstream and we actually probably caught twice as many fish as we would have caught staying in the slow pool anyway. But good point. Others? You getting there? Okay. Well, I think let's wrap up we're the there. YouTube. Uh... Thanks for all the... Uh, Interaction, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, thank you.